than anything working with choruses. That's like my favorite thing ever. So, what is it about the chorus that's different from? I mean, in the chorus, people are doing things on mass. Is there something about that artistry that that gets your creative? Well, I mean, it's just that's always in in the whole history of the universe. It's just what what is possible with the community mm -hmm. and what does it feel like to hold on to harmony and also to have the courage to leave something that feels harmonically safe and move into, you know, uh, complicated, complicated relationships between mm -hmm. people and between groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's the name and why we're on planet Earth. You know, I think there are probably other reasons to be on other planets, but this planet <laughs> seems to be about that. there being a spiritual quality in music. I'm an atheist. Can you talk to me what that word spiritual means and if that includes me? Well, I mean, it's really super, super basic. I mean, I don't want to get fancy. It's just, you know, the universe is more than you. And so what's that? What's, the, what's everything that isn't you? That's really interesting. I mean, we live in a society where everybody's trained to think of only themselves. But once you, for a second, wake up out of that, what happens when there are other people? What happens when there are waterfalls and lightning and intergalactic space and all kinds of stuff that can't be explained by you? And then you actually begin to look at you differently because, of course, you realize that the whole cosmos is existing in your body and in yourself. But you don't know that until you look at the cosmos. And then you kind of look at you way differently. So that's what we're just talking about. And it's like just everything where you are not the only yardstick by which life is measured. You know, politicians start from everything they know. We start from everything we don't know. So for me, it's like, why focus on just the, you know, one hundredth of a percent of your life? when all this other stuff is out there. So that's what spirituality means. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, there's a moral energy. Most people, as soon as you're just thinking about yourself, your only moral compass is what's good for me. And that ends up producing catastrophic results. And so the other part of spirituality is just that there's a moral, a set of moral codes that evolve once you recognize you're part of a larger ecosystem and that what's good for you may not be good for everyone so find what's good for everyone and then recognize what's good in that for you so that's spirituality mm. you know i guess that's related to um the sense of social justice that that vibrates in most of your work does art ought art have a sense of social justice or can art just be itself sometimes. See, I think justice is every decision you make every second of your life. I don't think you can lift justice out of the equation. You know, I mean, it's like, did you do the right thing? Is the only question you're asking all day of every single thing you do, touch, every person you talk to, everything you're doing, was that the right thing? Or was that the wrong thing? Like, that's justice. And what we do as artists is we choose the right red or mm, maybe more blue okay is that pianissimo just right or can we get it even a little more mm, 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 mm. all that's about making a really really right choice like super refined level of correct and that is justice that's oh, that's recognizing you have a range of choices and then say, mm, this is the better choice. And when you're with an artist who just has that innate ability to make the right choice and you just go, oh my God, yes, of course, right choice. Look, listen, oh my God, that is such the right choice. And you feel it because your entire physical being responds to justice. You can feel when you're in the presence of something right. So. Uh, for me, justice is the heart and soul of being alive. I get the feeling that, 
for you, um, community is part of all art, or all the art that you make, and it's not something separate. Oh, well, we'll have the community aspect of this project over here, and we'll we'll have the sing along, but then we'll have the real thing <laughs> afterwards. Even if you're just selfish and you just want to think about you, who are you? You or everyone you ever met. Like even if you really just want to look at you, you is all these people who shaped you. So there is no you. There is only a community <laughs> because you are only the communities you've hung out in. And what I always say to my students, if you want to change your life, get some new friends. You know, just go to some other place and hang out with different people. And you'll find the new you really quickly. <laughs> because you respond to who you're with. And, and the you is constantly in motion, depending on what community you're part of at any given moment. second you realize that instead of spending all this time worrying about your complexes, just go be of use to some other person. <laughs> Get over your cheap self and you're fine. You know, all you have to do is just for a second be more interested in someone else than you're in yourself. And then life opens. And of course it's one of these ironic things that so much white culture I think wishing well in some strange way was made in these antiseptic white boxes, you know, and Pierre Boulez even invented an electronic music studio underground in, you know, totally sealed cement, airtight, sanitary boxes. And you just want to say, actually, it was the bacteria that was helping. <laughs> you just, like, excluded yourself from everything cool in life. It's only people who make culture in big white boxes that needed to invent the outreach program because <laughs> they're the ones that had to reach out. <laughs> if you're doing it, right ways up, you know. It's where beginning. you start, yeah. not where you finish. Audiences, do you think the audience is always right? Or is the audience sometimes wrong? Right? The audience is clue-free. The audience has no idea. You have no idea what's happening to you in your life when it's happening. So for me, uh, I don't ever care about what the audience reaction is on the night because none of us know what's happening to us when it's happening. And all of us, the more we live, you look back on things and understand them differently in light of subsequent experiences. And, and we, at the time, don't realize that something's leading to something else. And so... Um, and in fact, in fact, my rule is when I'm at a performance myself and people ask you at the intermission, what do you think, is to talk about the weather. <laughs> because anything you say, you'll remember more than your actual reaction. Mm. So for me, I don't actually worry about the people who are there. And I don't really worry about what they thought in the moment. Um, and so I love audiences. I treat them well, but treating them well is like the only reason you have good friends is so they can challenge you. Somebody you don't really know well, you have to be polite to. Someone who you actually know, you can say, are you sure you want to wear that? <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> what about when, when an audience has an unexpected or weird or inappropriate reaction to something? Does that say to you that something in the work needs to change? Or does that say to you that there was something in the work that I didn't notice, but it can stay there and be itself? Some of my shows have this thing of, particularly theater, where half the audience is laughing, half the audience is angry. All these things are going on. Somebody sitting next to you has a totally opposite reaction. And you're turning and telling somebody to shut up. And like you watch that happen during the show. You know, for me, that's called democracy. It's what you want. you want. You don't want everyone to have the same reaction. You actually want to create something that has, that everybody there saw and felt something different. Not saw and felt the same thing. You know, for me, the wanting everyone in the auditorium to feel the same thing is what a Hollywood blockbuster movie is trying to do. Get us all to cry at the same moment. You know, which is like so irritating. Yeah. You know, when the mechanical 
you know, tongue rips into your solar plexus and <laughs> goes cry. You know, like, yeah. no. So for me, I don't want to feel manipulated. I don't want to feel that I'm being handled by an expert manipulator. And I don't want to manipulate my audience. I, 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 and the opposite. I want freedom of speech. I want freedom of thought. I want freedom of association. I want emotional freedom. I want to be able to go wherever I go and feel that I'm in an emotionally rich vector that includes this generous slice of humanity where all of us are feeling slightly or really different things. And so suddenly it's creating this gorgeous, amazing, emotional landscape. And that's why I make most of my shows, there's always too much happening. So somebody's looking over there and the person right next to you is looking over there. And literally they saw a different show. And obviously, you know, what's a Mozart symphony mean? If your grandmother died the night before, one thing. Like all kinds of things mm. are in that music. So for me though, the pleasure is inappropriate reaction because Who's to say what appropriate is? Opera in Australia. I think we have a, <laughs> a kind of internal crisis in Australia where we're asking ourselves, is there any point in writing an Australian opera? <laughs> I mean, there have been some that have resonated. Brett Dean's Bliss and right. Kate miller Heidke's The Rabbits, which uh, really resonates. I was supposed to say that, too. yeah. What is your advice to us? and our opera culture, or to our composers. You know, I'm American, so you're gonna get weird, you know, you know, if you think Australians are complex, guess what, America has its own complexes as well, right? Mm. Okay, so we're equally complex. But, just to say, for me, just starting from the nationalist point of view is already irritating. Sophocles didn't say, now I'm gonna write a Greek play. Now I'm going to write a play. wrote a play and about stuff he was dealing with. You know, it's going to be Australian whether they want it to be or not. So don't think Australian all day. Australian opera, like certain American opera, got off to a really bad start by following Benjamin Britten. You know, the whole, all the earmarks of a Britain opera visited on the Australian landscape are horrifying. So that's, for me, step one, <laughs> is just banish Benjamin Britten. Mm. and banish opera as, you know, something you write for your knighthood and all that, which is, of course, also part of his deal and also part of his having to hide his gayness and all this other weird stuff. The Brit operas offer a very bizarre path to follow. And to me, the, the dishonesties of those pieces are really as powerful as the honesties. You know, Verdi was not writing for a knighthood. He's writing because there was an occupying army in his country and he was trying to get them out. The history of opera is about topics. It's about something that really had to be dealt with. Not a kind of empty literary or aesthetic gesture. So let's make opera this amazing thing of how do we collaborate across art forms, across disciplines, across economic lines, across political lines, across racial lines, across, you know, like how do you get an interesting group of people all in one room working together who all have way different points of view about life. Opera is intelligent, imaginative adults creating a project of shared space. And also I have to say, your generation is so fortunate because uh, the budgets are finished. It's just, you can't write those big old Lusitania pieces. <laughs> Quadruple winds and you huge string can't. sections. Yeah. Yeah. You just can't do it. Yeah. And that's fantastic. You have to do something cheap do and dirty yeah. and that can be taken around in a taxi cab. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, and to me, the, the less official weight it has, the more life is actually going on. <laughs> quote here I want to ask you about. <laughs> he said, this is the uh, Polar Music Prize oh. acceptance. <laughs> music is about everything we're hoping for and that's not here yet. And music is here ahead of time to tell us it's coming. Can a Haydn symphony or a Bach motet or a Mozart string quartet tell us what's coming? It's cool that you use those examples actually because, you know, my obsession is Haydn and Mozart. They invented the string quartet. 
to actually demonstrate equality and say, okay, we're going to have a laboratory situation and we're going to show you that equality is possible, sustainable, could work, and this is what it means and this is what its consequences are. We will make a working artistic example of something that at the moment is a vision of a future. But we will, as artists, make that future available to you now. And so for me, that moment, why we, the Viennese classical style is this high point in the history of Western music is exactly because it's connected with the need to create democracy, the need to create equality, the need to create socially visionary things that everybody's longing for. So I think that is what art is always about. You look at Beethoven's concerts. The concert was the occasion for a community to come together, a community that is under duress and under attack and to build back their resistance, build back their confidence, and reanimate their determination to face tomorrow, which is gonna be difficult. And so Beethoven wrote a symphony. Um, I want to ask you about your, your teaching at UCLA. You teach uh, art as moral action. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, you don't need to teach. You could be off directing anything you want anywhere in the world, but you do, and it's, and I, I'm sure you don't just gloss over as well because you have PhD students to supervise and really very detailed, uh, high responsibility. Why do you teach and what's your motivation? You know, you want to be with the most exciting people on earth. And, <laughs> and so, yes, you're going to teach because that's how you're going to be with the coolest people. Yeah. Uh, and my graduate students are the coolest people I've ever met in my life. And they're like way ahead of me. And I'm learning from them. Uh, uh, but what I can also do is offer them a certain empowerment and permission because the world hardly ever gives you permission for your best ideas. It's amazing to do Black Lives Matter with 400 university students and take that subject matter and learn in a room with really interesting and diverse people and test what that subject matter could be which is way different from me sitting at home alone in a room reading a book so yeah. teaching is just way more dynamic way to learn and it's also a way to recognize what a younger generation is thinking so i'm not just locked in the thoughts of my own generation but I'm constantly with younger people and saying, oh, right, that's what you're thinking. Oh, okay. So it really enriches who I am. And it lets me embark on projects with a much more interesting uh, uh, kind of a, uh, cross-section of ideas and understanding of realities. <laughs> experience of teaching so just makes you humble in the face of and makes you not judge people and of course in my class it's very famous for everybody gets an A because I don't believe in evaluation I don't believe in them I mean in dentist school okay <laughs> happy to know that the person who worked on my teeth you know knows what they're doing but in moral questions the person who looks squeaky clean is actually committing every depredation on earth. <laughs> yeah. And the person who's the all-time heroin addict is actually has the highest moral standards. You get to my place in life, and now I realize, oh, a bunch of things I really needed to accomplish in my lifetime, I am not going to accomplish. And history, which I thought was going one way, went in the opposite direction for the last 30 years. Mm. And so, in fact, we're starting behind where we were 30 years ago at the moment. So there's a whole lot more work to do that I'm not going to be around for. So you've got to give the next generation of people everything you can possibly give them to press on at the moment with what they are facing. <laughs> How is it that someone can say such a dickhead comments and be rewarded? I think the rewarding of dickheads is not a recent historical phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> There's a well-established tradition. <laughs> Which he fits with that. Forever <laughs> dancer. <laughs> but now, don't I get to interview you? Oh, of course, you can. You can say or ask anything you want. Okay, yes, I will. Gordon, at what point did you decide? Okay, you had to make space for the world that you imagined and wanted to hear. I had been playing piano since I was five and loving it. But as a teenager, I started to discover that I, I had musical ideas that. I liked to play that were my own ideas, that were original, and I just took this further, I guess. And it was something that just, there was just no question about it. Do you know what I mean? I do. It just started to happen, and before I knew it, it was just happening. And what There's nothing the, else to do. What were the key moments that just, like, launched and triggered certain oh, well, next steps? When I was 16, I, I met Nigel Butterley, a composer that I'd admired for several years, and I met him by accident by walking into the wrong lecture room in a university, and he and there was a room full of students, and he looked at me and said, who are you? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm work experience. And he said, well, can we call you work? And then <laughs> I went all red-faced, and it was all so embarrassing. He said, come in anyway, come in, sit down, sit down here in the front. And I sat down, and he was talking about contemporary music techniques and manipulation of motifs and things and uh, I did all the exercises that he gave to everyone and I brought them up afterwards and he showed them to, I showed them to him and he said oh well you know let's let's have lunch tomorrow and you can show me some of your music and actually it was just the fact that he was so generous with his time and he he took me seriously even though I was 16 years old and he looked at my music and made all these interesting comments I just thought wow I need to keep going and when did you start forming groups? I followed a girl to uh, to Germany, and I lived in Germany for five years, and I had in Bremen. Oh, okay. Hardcore. Yeah, yeah. That's real Germany. <laughs> That's not Berlin. <laughs> and we stayed there for five years together, and I, at the start I had no money, and um, I started to form little choirs from the community. And one of the choirs that I... Uh, created was to do just the, the weird wacky music that I was writing and that my friends were writing and then I had an invitation to come back and take over the Australian Voices which has been an established group for now 20 years so I've been doing that for five years and is that just the foreseeable future or you have other things in your mind orchestral music okay yeah I've just written three pieces in the last year for the the orchestra here the Queensland Symphony okay which they've done and this is just such an exciting, okay. amazing thing oh, for me wow. where I just, I, I oh, feel like cool. I'm really myself oh, when I'm writing oh, orchestral music. Cool. Yeah. So much stuff, so much oh, layers, so many cool. toys to play oh, with. Cool. It's, it's, oh, how great. But um, I still love choirs. The choir is like the string quartet. It's this pure, stripped back, neutral, four equal or five or six equal voices that's so, it's homogenous, it's... It, uh, it can be monochromatic, although it doesn't have to be. So that, that for me, it's the two ends of the spectrum. The choir is this core way of making stripped back music. And the, the symphony orchestra is about layers and colours and things working against each other. And what is the subject matter that you're working on for your new pieces? Well, I'm about to write a piece for um, an orchestra in Cologne, the VDR, the WDR, uh, Rundfunk. Right. Uh, I've taken... Arnold Schwarzenegger um, speech as he um, as he said uh, the people of California they needed a hero and I was an action hero so I'm taking this and just looping it over and over again it'll play out of speakers and the orchestra will just play along with um, with some sort of Austrian folk music kind of uh, buried deep in inside the orchestra somewhere sounds nauseating <laughs> uh, yeah it could be it could be <laughs> if that's what it is then that's what it is <laughs> felt listening to Le Grand Macabre? Well, I mean, Le Grand Macabre compares favorably to Act One of Fidelio. <laughs> <laughs> it does. A lot of the same concerns. Uh, and is this bizarre experiment between words and melodrama and little arias and odd little bits and pieces. Yeah. Uh, uh, this kind of opera made out of table scraps. You know, the Grand Macabre is actually a really beautiful response to surviving the Holocaust, which look at he did. And feeling that you got through when everyone else around you was marked for death, but not really being part of that. Mm -hmm. And
And so the piece has this fake humor because uh, he's not laughing, which is why the jokes are not funny. Right. Um, yeah. I know. I know. So, I, of course, I did, I think, probably the first production of it that was really serious. And Ligeti really was really moved by it for two maybe three days and then it all turned on it hated it yeah hated it hated it what happened why well because it you know it it was real and he designed the piece to keep a lot of real things at a distance Mm -hmm. and um the music was real but most of the words were not and uh yeah, and, and and you know it's it's just a bizarre thing, and I, I and I think also Beethoven and Ligeti had this in common that their their only opera was a failure <laughs> and a kind of mess. Yeah, and it's because they were dealing with theater people who were also really irritating. Yeah, and so it had the weakness of. Are you, are you including yourself as one of those well, irritating think, theater people? I think it just had the weakness of theater of its time. Right. But Fidelio has the weakness of Viennese theater of the 1820s, you know. Whereas, and so for me, Beethoven's real opera is the Missa Solemnis. That's where Beethoven is. That's his real stage. That's what he has in mind. Yeah. Not Fidelio. Yeah. So, again, I think Ligeti's real theater is when he permits himself these other spaces. And the closer Grand Macabre comes to those other spaces, the more interesting it gets. And the farther it gets away from official theater, which is why I really, of course, hated that stupid movement of everything has to be set in its correct period. You know, are you kidding? <laughs> Mozart was being suffocated by that damn period. Don't like order him to go back to it. To me, all this music is a message to the future, and none of it belongs in its own period. And everything, most music, could never actually be heard in the period it was written, and we're only able to gradually hear it now. And of course, most opera suffers from the opera of its moment. (laughs) (laughs) I think it goes for not just opera, but many things. Yeah. And you know, yes, your high school yearbook. You can't believe you were wearing that. (laughs) But you know. (laughs) How did you see that? (laughs) (laughs) So, so, you know, that kind of stuff. But. well, it's totally cool to meet you, Gordon. Yeah, that was that was totally, totally cool. cool.